Welcome back. We're taking a conjurer and we are leveling them up to level 20. In this part of the video, I'm going to be talking about levels 5 through 10. If you haven't seen the first part, you should watch it first just to know what we've been working with. So uh, you will find links for that in the video description or the comments down below. Uh, but for everybody who has seen that first part, let's get started on getting this character up to level 10. So we are currently at level 4. We're going to go up to level 5. So level five is always a big deal for wizards. It's actually a big deal for most characters, uh, but certainly wizards, we see a massive difference in the power level of spells from levels two to three. Now with this character, we are working with a 14 intelligence score and it's not gonna go up. We could still take something like hypnotic pattern or fear and get a reasonable amount of use out of it uh, because we would uh, hit enough enemies that probably some are still gonna fail their saving throw, but we would not be as good at it as a wizard with a 16 intelligence. I would rather concentrate on spells that I'm gonna be just as good at with, as another wizard, but still take great spells. So how do we do that with a fifth level wizard? So normally with a wizard, when we get to fifth level, I'm looking at either Hypnotic Pattern or Fear or maybe Sleet Storm uh, as my big gun spell uh, because all those spells hit a lot of targets uh, and usually a number of fail their saving throw and with Fear and Hypnotic Pattern they're not even getting a second saving throw. With Sleet Storm we're getting secondary effects like Blocked Sight uh, and Difficult Terrain. Now this character can already block sight with fog cloud. I think there's a bit of redundancy with sleet storm uh, and then fear and hypnotic pattern. We could take those here and they'd be okay. Uh, we wouldn't want to keep them prepared at high levels because our DC is not going to go up at the same rate that another wizard will because we're not going to be raising our intelligence score. So what I want to do here is I want to look at spells uh, that don't require intelligence and I also want to look at conjuration spells because they are going to be enhanced once we get to level 10. And so if there's good conjuration spells, we want to pick them up. Uh, and this is a character, again, I've talked about, uh, we want to concentrate a little bit on summoning. And another thing about this character is we have the skulker feet and we have the ability to hide as a bonus action. My personal opinion is that those kind of characters work especially well when they have minions serving them. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to add a bunch of minions to this character. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to grab Animate Dead. Animate Dead is a good spell. Uh, now, some people consider it evil. It really depends on the campaign world and how your DM views it. Uh, and so maybe in a campaign that's good, you're not going to be able to do Animate Dead. I think there's no reason a goblin should necessarily be good, uh, so you might not be a good character to begin with. You're going to have to work that out with your DM. In terms of the build, I think this is a strong addition. So Animate Dead is going to allow us to pick a pile of bones or a corpse of a medium or small humanoid within range, and then we create a skeleton or a zombie. Then on your turns, you can use a bonus action to give that creature command. It just gives us another minion in combat who can do things. Uh, and then we can be hidden because we're mentally commanding that creature that doesn't give us away. Uh, so it is a way that we can combine uh, the hiding with the ability to do effective things in combat. And remember that enemy dead isn't using our bonus action every round. So we have the first round of combat and we have our enemy dead attack that enemy. Uh, then we're going to do maybe the hide action, uh, jump out, attack with advantage, do the hide action again as a bonus action, uh, maybe cast a spell, do the hide action again as a bonus action. And with a skulker ability, we're often going to be able to do that. Uh, and then our anime dead will just be one more way to improve our action economy in combat. Also, just like a familiar, you could have your anime dead do the help action. So you could have your anime dead just help, help, help. Now, anime dead, uh, skeletons and zombies don't have a ton of hit points. Uh, so if you wanted to have a ranged attack that maybe will make that less of a target, uh, then I would recommend do the skeleton. And then you can give the skeleton a bow, uh, and then they can use their bow in combat. The second spell I'm going to take is one I normally don't take with a wizard, uh, but with a wizard that's going to be focused on conjuration and a wizard that is going to be focused on summoning, uh, I want to get all the options and summon lesser demons is one of those ones that I don't love this spell, 
uh, but I do think it's useful for this character. Again, just like with Animate Dead, we can combine it with our own ability to hide, and that is really useful to us. Uh, now, what I don't like about Summon Lesser Demons is normally the player chooses the number of creatures, and then the DM chooses the creature. Uh, unless it's a summon spell that summons one creature, often then uh, a player might have the choice of what creature is going to be selected. With Summon Lesser Demons, we have no control. We're going to roll randomly how many creatures are summoned, and then the DM is going to choose which creatures are summoned. But there's not a lot of challenge rating one quarter, one half, or one demons in the game. Most demons have a much higher challenge rating. So there's actually not a lot of selections here. Uh, so you're going to roll a d6, you're going to get either two challenge rating one creatures, four challenge rating half creatures, or eight challenge rating quarter creatures. Now what we want to do is we want to summon lesser demons on the other side of the enemies, because summon lesser demons are hostile to both you and anyone else. Uh, so if you put a bunch of summoned lesser demons beside you and the party, that's who they're going to attack. That's not exactly how we want to be helping the party. Uh, but if we have a group of enemies and we have our allies, and then we do the summon lesser demons on the other side, then they will be attacking our enemies. Now, if those demons are still alive when our enemies go down, then we cease concentration on this spell and they disappear. As I said, there's not a lot of choices for the DM, uh, so you have some reasonable guesses as to what you're going to get with this spell. Uh, if you're going to get challenge rating 1 8 creatures, you're basically going to get mains. That's really kind of the only option. Uh, small Fiend, terrible armor class, 9 hit points, uh, and they can do 1 attack with claws, plus 2 to hit, uh, for 2d4 slashing damage. That's not great. But, if you are getting mains, then you're getting eight of them. So that's eight attacks at plus two, 2d4 damage. That suddenly is not bad offensively. They also have a number of defenses. They have resistance to cold, fire, or lightning damage, and immunity to poison, uh, and they can see in the dark. Uh, so again, this is by far the weakest creature you can get, but if you get them, you're going to get a lot of them. Now, if we're looking at quarter challenge rating creatures, there's two choices. There's the Abyssal Wretch or the Dretch. I think the Dretch is more likely for you to get because it's in the Monster Manual. So the Dretch has 18 hit points, uh, which means it has a fair bit more than the mains do. And the Dretch has a multi-attack. It can attack both with its bite and its claws, so it's going to get two attacks around. Each of them are plus two to hit, one for d6, one for 2d4. Then it has a Fetid Cloud ability that it can do once per day, uh, and it creates a 10-foot radius cloud from the Dretch, and that radius cloud, there's a poison save, uh, or they can have the poison condition for a turn. It's a pretty small effect, uh, but as long as we have them on the other side of the enemies, we're probably not going to be contained in it. So basically, we get half as many, and they're about twice as powerful as we would get from a main, so it's going to end up being a pretty similar effect. Then if we get two creatures, we're likely going to get the Quasit. So that's the only challenge rating one demon in the Monster Manual. Uh, now, if we get Quasits, uh, they don't get as good offense or defense. Seven hit points, uh, so that's less than the mains uh, with a 13 armor class, which isn't great. Uh, so the Quasits can go down a lot easier. However, they can use Invisible. However, offensively, they are definitely better. Uh, plus four to hit instead of the plus two for d4 plus 3 piercing damage, and then there is a poison on top of that that can do another 2d4 points of damage and give the poison condition. So significantly better offense than we've seen with the other ones. The Quasi can also do a scare ability uh, that uh, targets one creature and it makes a wisdom saving throw or it's frightened for a minute. Now, it does get a saving throw every round. The scare ability actually isn't very good. They're probably better off just doing their claws. Of course, you're not going to pick that. The DM is going to pick what they do. Uh, so actually, I find that the closet is probably the worst of the choices there. Uh, if we get the mains or the uh, dretches, we're going to get just fairly reliable, just straight out uh, targets for enemy attacks and some damage to the enemies. And then what we want to do is once they're in business, what we want to do is we can hide, uh, and then we can just let these demons do their thing, and again, once the enemy is defeated, if there's still demons left at that point, we end our concentration, and they're gone. So when we look at our spell preparations, I definitely want to prepare both these spells. 
Uh, and I can't, right? Because uh, we only have one additional preparation, which means we have to get rid of something. So I think there's two decent options for choices here. Uh, number one, we could get rid of our fog cloud. Because we have Skulker now, we can often use a hide action when we couldn't before, so we need fog cloud less. Uh, the other option is Cloud of Daggers because at 44 damage just isn't scaling well at this point. Uh, so it's not a lot of damage for us. Uh, now we can potentially increase the damage by 2d4, uh, which is decent scaling if we can hit creatures for multiple rounds with it, or we can hit multiple creatures with it. Um, if we can't do that, if you don't have a grappler in your party, Cloud of Daggers is definitely the one to get rid of. But if you do have somebody who is good at keeping somebody stuck in place, we might want to keep the Cloud of Daggers. Uh, so it really depends on your party makeup. In this case, I'm going to get rid of Cloud of Daggers. And then we're going to prepare both our Animate Dead and our Summon Lesser Demons. So what both these things do is they both improve our action economy, and they both increase the amount of damage we can do in combat. And they are both things that we can be using while we're hidden. Uh, so all those things are very useful to us. Anime Dead isn't using concentration, Summon Lesser Demons is, so they don't conflict in that way either. Now I should mention that at 5th level, cantrips have scaled. So wizards who use things like Firebolt, for example, are doing 2d10 damage instead of 1d10 damage, and suddenly now they can do more damage with that cantrip than we can do with a light crossbow. It's not a huge amount more damage, but more damage in general. Uh, now we still might want to use our light crossbow sometimes, because often we're hidden, we might be attacking from hidden, get advantage, uh, and then we can hide again. And once we add advantage in, that damage difference really does decline. But certainly more at this point, we want to be adding to our damage with that Undead Servant, uh, with the ability to summon lesser demons. So having just the one attack with the Light Crossbow is not as big a deal. At level 6, we get a really nice ability. So the ability at level 6 is Benign Transposition. Starting at 6th level, you can use your action to teleport up to 30 feet to an unoccupied space that you can see. That's the same as with a Misty Step, uh, except that a Misty Step uses your bonus action, and it's a spell. Alternatively, you can choose a space within range that's occupied by a small or medium creature. If that creature is willing, you both teleport, swapping places. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest or you cast a Conjuration spell of 1st level or higher. So let me explain what this can do, uh, because I often talk about uh, using Thunderstep or Dimension Door to help an ally, and I think that's a really useful ability to have, and wizards can access it for the first time, potentially at level 5, if they take Thunderstep right away, which they usually don't, because there's so many good 3rd level spells, uh, but often at level 7 when they get Dimension Door. Uh, and the idea is, is you have an ally who's in trouble, uh, and then you move in, and then you can get them out using that spell. Uh, with Benign Transposition, what we can do is we can switch places with that ally. Uh, so if we have, say, let's say we have an ally, and they got grappled, and now they're getting beat on, and they're in big trouble. Well, what can we do? Well, we do Benign Transposition, and we switch places with them. Now we're in trouble, so what do we do? Well, we cast Misty Step, because that's a bonus action, uh, and because Benign Transposition isn't a spell, it doesn't break the uh, restriction on using bonus action spells. So then we get away with our Misty Step, and then what happens? Well, the Misty Step is a Conjuration spell, so we get our Benign Transposition back. So we get essentially the same bonus that we would have gotten from a Thunder Step or a D Dimension Door, except we only use the second level spell, and an ability that we got back right away. Of course, there's utility uses here as well. It's teleportation. Just keep in mind, we only get it back on a long rest or when we cast a Conjuration spell. You might note, I mentioned that we're going to be concentrating on Conjuration spells, and you've probably seen more Conjuration spells with this character than you normally do. This is part of the reason why. We want to be able to have this ability available to us whenever we need it. And once we use it, we want to be able to get it back easily without having to do a long rest. Uh, so by having lots of conjuration spells, that's easy to do. Now last level, we took two spells that required preparation and it really hurt. You saw we had to unprepare a spell that we could still potentially make use out of. Uh, and I don't like doing that. And we've only got one more preparation at this level. 
and we haven't prepared absorb elements yet. And we're at the point where we probably want that prepared as well. Again, not increasing your intelligence and starting with lower intelligence creates some uh, stretch on preparations that are usually already pretty tight. Uh, so what I want to do here is I want to take two rituals. Uh, and when we're talking about third level spells, there's two rituals that I always like to take. Uh, the first one that I always do take is Lehman's Tiny Hut, which is a way to get a safe long rest for our party. The second one I want to take is Water Breathing. Often I don't have room for uh, that spell with these builds where I'm not improving the number of spells known based on uh, finding a spell book or buying spells or finding it on a scroll uh, because we don't always have that opportunity. Uh, so I'm taking the worst case scenario. Uh, so I'm going to take water breathing with this character. So I'm going to have water breathing that gives your entire party, including your familiar, any followers, anyone else, uh, we can give everybody the ability to breathe water for 24 hours. So if we do this at the beginning of the day, everyone can breathe water whenever they want. Uh, and then the tiny hut for long rest. These are both very useful utility spells. And because neither of them required preparation, I can now go back and get that absorb elements prepared that I definitely want prepared as I get into the higher levels. So seventh level gets us into our fourth level spells. And this is the point where we get a significant boost to our offensive capability. Again, preparations is a concern here, uh, but we definitely want two spells that are both gonna require preparation. The first one we're going to take is Polymorph. Uh, because Polymorph is the best buff in the game at this level. Turn your ally into a giant ape. They get two great attacks that do lots of damage. They get a pile of hit points that they can lose. And once the spell is over, they are back to full hit points. Or you can cast it on an ally that's near going down uh, to turn them into the giant ape. Uh, so just an amazing buff for this level. By far the best at 7th level. Not reliant on intelligence. Now, if we were to use this offensively, it would rely on intelligence, but that generally isn't the way we use this spell. The second one I'm gonna take is Summon Greater Demon. This is a big boost over uh, Summon Lesser Demons because we get a much more powerful creature. We can choose a challenge rating five or lower creature. The creature I hear about the most with this spell is Tanaruk, uh, which is in Volo's Guide to Monsters, and it's basically just a huge brute. 95 hit points, which is nice hit points for this level. They're resistant to fire and poison. I should mention Tanaruk looks like an orc. It's like this big, nasty, fiendish-looking orc. It has the aggressive ability, like orcs, where it can use its bonus action to move up to twice its speed towards a hostile creature that it can see. It has magic resistance. It has multi-attack, plus 7 to hit, for 1d8 plus 4 piercing damage and great sword attack plus 7 to hit uh, for 2d6 plus 4 slashing damage. So pretty good damage as well. And also what it can do as a reaction is, is if it gets hit by an enemy, it can attack it back with advantage with its great sword. So this thing is just basically a tank. Tons of hit points, good offense, and you can sick it on your enemies. Again, just like with the summon lesser demons, we want it on the other side of us. Now we can potentially control a summon greater demon, but I would not count on it because certainly if it has magic resistance, it's going to do charisma saving throw against our not great spell DC. It's going to succeed. It's probably going to succeed with any wizard pretty quickly. So I wouldn't worry so much about that. I would treat it just like a summon lesser demons where we assume it's going to be hostile to us. We summon it on the opposite side of the enemy and it starts laying into them. And this is the kind of damage where an enemy can't really ignore it. They kind of have to deal with it and this thing isn't easy to deal with. Now the Tanaru technically does have a negative saving throw with charisma so there is at least some chance they'll fail their saving throw. So I would still at least try to control them. I just wouldn't count on it uh, because with our spell DC, even with a minus one, and we're rolling with advantage, at best we're going to have a round or two. The other demon I think is really strong with this spell is the Babao demon. Uh, it's also from Volo's Guide to Monsters, and it's only challenge rating 4, which would make you think it wouldn't be as good. But I think in a lot of ways, it's better than Tanaruk. Uh, now, the 82 hit points is a little bit less, but it's still a lot of hit points. And it has a higher armor class, so it can be hit less often, which means those hit points will stretch out further. Uh, it has so many damage resistances. Cold, fire, lightning, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical attacks. And that means that as long as the attacks are non-magical from the enemies, this will likely have basically twice the staying power 
that the Tanaruk will have. It has immunity to poison, dark vision 120 feet. Uh, it has innate spell casting. It can cast darkness, dispel magic, fear, heat, metal, and levitate, and it can do all those at will. Uh, so if you can control this creature for a round or two, you might find it might get some use out of something like a big fear cone that doesn't affect you or your allies. So that's a lot of really nice at will spells to have. Uh, but if it's just doing its attacks, pretty good. It has multi attack, so it makes two attacks. It can attack with claw or spear. Uh, chance to hit is always plus six. Damage is always d8 plus four. That's a little bit less than the Tanaruk, but not a lot. It also has another ability called Weakening Gaze, where uh, the enemy will make a constitution saving throw, and if they fail, uh, then their offense is reduced. Uh, in general, uh, it's probably not as effective as their straight-out attacks. Uh, so in many ways, I think the Babao Demon is tougher than the Tanaruk. Maybe a little bit less in straight-out damage, but not a lot less, and certainly better in defense. Another thing is, is this demon does not have magic resistance which means that if we're trying to control it it doesn't get advantage on its saving throw now it has a plus one instead of a minus one but plus one without advantage is worse than minus one with advantage against our spell dc uh, the only downside i really see to doing a babao demon versus a tanaruk that's significant is when we lose control their spells are just too good uh, they have a fear cone that could very potentially get right through the enemy and still get us as well. And they can do it at will. They could cast a heat metal, which could really hurt one of the members of our party if they're wearing heavy armor. And things like a darkness might be a problem for us as well. Uh, so once we lose control of the Babao Demon, they're potentially more dangerous to us. And that might be the biggest downfall. Uh, so if we're going to have a DM that's going to be using that cleverly against us, we might just want to do Tanaruk just because it's simple and direct. It does what it's supposed to do. So level 7 is actually a big boost in the effectiveness of this character. Adding Polymorph and Summon Greater Demons really shores things up nicely for us. Uh, and again, remember, we can use Hide after we've summoned that Greater Demon. That might even prevent it from attacking us if we were an applicable target. And again, Neither of these spells, particularly, are going to be reliant on intelligence. If we use Polymorph offensively, it does, and technically speaking, it affects the saving throw of the demon, but in the way that we're using the demon, the saving throw probably doesn't matter a lot. In fact, we're using it the same way as a spell that we were previously using, where they, we had no chance of controlling that creature. Uh, and then with our Polymorph, we're probably not using it offensively. We're using it as a buff. So 8th level brings our next ability score increase. Now because of the way that we use summoning spells, initiative is pretty important. If everything just gets confused with our allies and our enemies, uh, then often it's going to be difficult, especially with uh, creatures that are hostile to us, to place them in a way to reliably have them attack our enemies and not us. But if we win initiative and we can put them on the other side of the enemy, then it is reliable and often that will affect the positioning of combat because once the enemies are attacked they're going to tend to turn on their attacker that might be a tanaruk then we can attack from the outside and it just changes the whole dynamic of the combat so i'd say winning initiative is pretty important so let's take the alert feat this is going to give us a plus five bonus to initiative plus our current plus three that's plus eight we will win more initiatives uh we can't be surprised while we're conscious being immune to surprise is really useful, especially with a character that relies on stealth. Uh, and other creatures don't get an advantage on attack rolls against us as a result of being unseen by us. Uh, that's maybe less useful for us because we're often hidden. But overall, we're getting a ton from this feat. I think it's a really good choice at this level. Again, lucky is a consideration. Again, increasing our dexterity score is a consideration. Uh, but I do think alert brings us more than those at this level. Now we're looking at two more fourth level spell selections. Uh, again, we didn't increase our preparations by increasing our intelligence, so preparations are gonna be a problem. We'll talk about preparations in a moment, but I am gonna be taking two spells that both require preparation. So the first one I'm gonna take is Conjure Minor Elementals. Now I already have a summoning spell at fourth level, which is Summon Greater Demon. The reason why I want Conjure Minor Elementals and a very specific situation where I want to use them is that unlike the demon spell, I can control the elementals. So when I'm in a situation 
where if I summon something that's going to be hostile to us, might attack us, then I want to use Conjure Minor Elementals instead. It is going to be the safer option, even though it has a little bit less of a bang. So with Conjure Minor Elementals, we summon elementals and we choose how many we're going to summon. We can summon one elemental of challenge rating two or lower, two of one or lower, four of half or lower, or eight of a quarter or lower. Now the DM is going to pick uh, what creatures are summoned based on the challenge rating. Uh, when we're talking about eight one quarter creatures, we're probably going to get some kind of method. Uh, there's a number of methods it might be but they all have similar statistics. Uh, we can see about 21 hit points, uh, so certainly a lot more hit points than we would get with our summon lesser demons, as well as them being friendly to us. Uh, again, they're immune to being poisoned. Uh, they have resistance to fire and poison. That's going to change depending on the kind of method they are. Uh, what they get is they get claw attacks for plus 2 to hit, d4 damage, plus 1d4 uh, fire damage, so 2d4 damage. Uh, or they can do their Steam Breath, which is a recharge ability. Uh, and it's a 15-foot cone, so we can potentially hit multiple enemies, uh, and it, it does 1d8 fire damage. So this is not great damage on its own, but 8 attacks worth of it. Uh, so once we do 8 attacks worth of it, it's okay damage. It's still not anywhere near what we would get with our Summon Greater Demons, but it's safer. But in general, uh, defensively, there's a pretty big chunk of hit points from doing this. Offensively, not super tough, uh, but I would have as many of them as you can do that cone attack if they can hit more than one enemy, because uh, that does increase the offense a bit. Now, I would generally avoid the half challenge rating, because there's just so many variants there, you have no idea what you're going to get. But if we do the challenge rating 1, the odds are very good we're going to get the Fire Snake, uh, which is a 22 hit point creature. That's not a ton of hit points, but it does have damage resistance uh, to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing. So that might be more like 44 hit points, which is much better. Uh, and then it's two creatures, and they each do okay damage because they can make uh, two attacks, and both those attacks have a plus 3 to hit, and they do 1d4 plus 1d6 plus one damage. And creatures that attack the snake also take additional fire damage. So overall, this is not a bad choice for us. And if we do a challenge rating two creature, we're either going to get an Azur or we're going to get a Gargoyle, likely. Uh, and the Gargoyle is better defensively, the Azur does more damage. But we really have no control over what we're going to get. So whatever you get, you're going to work with it. Neither of them are as tough as the Tanaruk, so just keep that in mind. If you are in a position where you can safely use the Tanaruk, that's your better option. Uh, Conjure Minor Elementals is for when you don't have the option to do that safely. The other spell I want to take at this level, I have lots of combat spells now, so I'm going to take a really good utility spell, Arcane Eye. Uh, really one of the best 4th level spells in the game. Uh, it allows you to explore an entire dungeon, and again, uh, that I'm picking spells that are not relying on intelligence isn't an accident. So my preparation list at 8th level is I'm going to have Absorb Elements prepared, Mage Armor, and Shield. Those are my only first level spells prepared. At 2nd level I've kept Levitate prepared as well as Misty Step, uh, so I'm going to be using those for all my 2nd level slots. Uh, my 3rd level slot, I only have one preparation and that is Animate Dead. Uh, so what we want to do here is we want to cast it using all our third level slots, and that's going to give us one undead per casting of the spell. And then fourth level is where I have all my options. I can do Arcane Eye, Conjure Minor Elementals, Polymorph, or Summon Greater Demon. So depending on the needs of the situation, I pick the one I want. Again, I pick spells that deliberately that are not going to be significantly hampered by me having a lower intelligence score. So at this level, we're going to find that this character now has a fair bit more versatility in their 4th level spells. Because again, those Summon Demon spells are not necessarily safe. But Conjure Minor Elementals is. It's a little less effective, but it's safer. Uh, so we have that versatility depending on what we need for that moment. So at level 9, uh, I'm going to be looking at two 5th level spells. And there are so many selections here that are great for this character. Uh, and you can select any of the ones that you are your personal favorites. Uh, but I always look at Wall of Force uh, for any wizard at this level, and this character, no different. Remember, this provides no saving throw, 
Having a lower intelligence is not going to affect this spell at all, and it's one of the standouts for being a wizard. Uh, I wouldn't discount animate objects. Animate objects can do a lot of damage on your round. Uh, uses your concentration, but if you pick the 10 tiny objects, it is potentially a huge offensive boost to creatures that don't have resistance to it. Uh, and again, not reliant on our intelligence at all. Conjure Elemental, of course this character is going to want this spell because it is a summoning spell and an elemental is tougher than anything else we could have done up to now and it is friendly to us unless we lose concentration. Uh, now if you lose concentration, Conjure Elemental can be very problematic and I've seen this before where uh, we had a character who kept casting Conjure Elemental, kept losing control, the elemental would turn on the party at the same time the party's dealing with the enemy. An absolute nightmare. Uh, so we do not want to lose concentration on that spell. Uh, and we haven't really boosted our concentration saves that much either. So I might want to hold off on that one. Now one thing about planar binding though, although it might seem obvious for this character, is we cannot cast it on our own summoned creatures because casting planar binding, because it's more than a one action casting, requires our concentration. Uh, and then our spells require our concentration. Uh, so if we're going to do both of them, then planar binding isn't going to work. Also, we also need a way to prevent those creatures from turning on us during that time, especially with something like a summon greater demon spell. Uh, and we don't have magic circle either. So uh, we just don't have the spells required and we don't have the ability to maintain those creatures. If we're going to planar bind our summon creatures, it's actually better if another player has the planar binding spell. So I'm not going to worry about planar binding with this spell. And if nobody has planar binding, it's not a problem. Don't worry about it. We can just use our summon creatures as written. Rary's telepathic bond is basically a must. And I'm going to just take it now because it doesn't require preparation. And we need a spell that doesn't require preparation as one of the two. So a lot of great spells here to choose from. I'm going to pick Wall of Force as my first selection. Uh, and then we'll take a look at those other spells at next level. So fortunately, this level then, our preparation slots are easy. We're going to add Wall of Force. So when we get to 10th level, something very important happens with Conjurers. Uh, and that is Focused Conjuration. Beginning at 10th level, while you are concentrating on a Conjuration spell, your concentration can't be broken as a result of taking damage. Uh, so this is huge because we have lots of Conjuration spells, and they tend to be, for the most part, concentration spells. Certainly all our summoning spells are. Now we're going to get one more cantrip at this level and I just want to take something that's fun and utility based uh, and Prestidigitation will be that choice. Uh, and then we're going to go into our fifth level spells uh, and we're going to select two additional fifth level spells. And we would be crazy not to take Conjure Elemental at this point because of course I said one of the biggest problems with Conjure Elemental is that it can turn against you if you lose concentration. Well we're not going to lose concentration anymore with the Conjure Elemental spell, unless it's interfered with something like, say, a Sleet Storm or an Earthquake or something like that. Uh, but certainly, from taking damage, we will no longer lose concentration. That's by far the most common source of concentration checks. So Conjure Elemental now becomes safe. We can Conjure an Elemental. They're really tough. They have a ton of hit points. They have good offense. Uh, I, you tend to go for the Air Elemental just because it has better maneuverability than the others, because it has the flight. Uh, but if you're landlocked, then you can do something else. Lasts for an hour, which means that we can probably use it over multiple combats. There's a good chance it's going to survive combats, even if enemies are attacking it. When we get six level spells, there's also good reason to cast Conjure Elemental using a six level slot on air, because we can get an Invisible Stalker. And an Invisible Stalker is just about as tough as an elemental in combat, but it also has uh, the advantages of being able to track anybody anywhere, uh, which is super useful and kind of a divination effect that we get out of a conjuration spell. And we'll take animate objects. Uh, so we're going to have two spells that require preparation here, but animate objects does a lot of damage. And if that's what we want to do, 
we will find animate objects will do more damage than any summoned creature we could summon. The disadvantage of animate objects is I find that enemies tend not to attack animated objects, though they could, uh, but because there's so many of them uh, that it's just not worth it. And they tend to have good armor class and not terrible hit points, so uh, they're not easy to take down. So uh, if we want to be drawing enemy attacks, Animated objects actually doesn't work that well, but in terms of just straight out damage, I find it does work quite well. Uh, so we'll take it and it just gives us another option. Now we can only prepare one more spell, so we're going to need to unprepare a spell so we can prepare both our new spells. Uh, so we're going to unprepare Levitate, not something I expect to be casting very much anymore. Uh, so our second level spell, the only one we have prepared is Misty Step, so we can do Misty Step with Abandon. And remember, that is always bringing back our Benign Transposition as well. So there's a lot of very powerful things we can do here. Uh, we can use our fifth level slots on Conjuring an Elemental, uh, and Elementals are very tough, very good in combat, can take a ton of hit points damage. Uh, if we do an air elemental, they're fast, they fly, uh, they basically have it all. They have resistance to almost everything, uh, and they have uh, all kinds of immunities as well. Uh, but if we want to just really focus on doing damage, then we could do an animated objects. And animate objects just does more damage than anything else we can do at this level, unless the creature we're going up against has resistance or immunity to that kind of damage. Then we have Wall of Force. Wall of Force can just win us a combat uh, by reliably dividing enemies and it provides no saving throw. Uh, what do all three of these spells have in common? None of them are going to rely on our intelligence score. And don't forget that that Conjure Elemental, we cannot have our concentration broken as a result of taking damage because we are a Conjurer. That is also going to affect all our other Conjuration spells, which include all of our summoning spells. So that is the Conjurer from levels 5 through 10. Uh, the next part of this video, we will discuss the rest of the career of this character right up to level 20, and I tend to go through those levels a little faster. Uh, so if you want to check that out, you're going to find a link to it in the video description or in the comments down below. You will also find a link to the finished build of this character in the comments or the uh, video description down below. And so I hope to see you for the next part.